Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. BS stands for Building Science, of course. Uh, tonight's topic is the benefits of bio-based building materials. Uh, my name is Mike Maines. Uh, tonight, I am drinking a mocktail of uh, main root ginger beer and uh, seed lip uh, non-alcoholic distilled spirits. It makes a really good mocktail, one of my favorite drinks, alcoholic or otherwise. Um, BS and Beer started just as a local uh, local building science discussion group, um, and we still encourage other local groups, so feel free to start one near you. It's a great way to uh, meet people and share local knowledge. Um, get in touch with us if you want some tips. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building Magazine for being our media partners, and I will turn it over to Brian. Oh, all right. Hey, everyone. Uh, Brian Pontalolo from Green Building Advisor and Fine Home Building. Um, I'm having, uh, again, I'm having uh, homebrewed kombucha. Tonight it is uh, strawberry watermelon flavor. Um, delicious as usual. Then I'll turn it over to Emily. Hey guys, Emily Mottram. I'm an architect here in Maine. Um, today for my drink, this is for you, Travis. I walked into our uh, our local CSA first week. It was open, saw this. It's by Oxbow Brewing, which is a local brewery by local. Thought I will try that. Cracked it open, Travis. This is a sour. It's terrible. So this is to you. Here's, this is as much of it as I will drink. I poured the rest out for my husband and I have a backup beer. <laughs> so um, we have uh, an email list uh, for the show. So if you haven't joined our mailing list, go over to uh, the bsandbeershow.com and join the mailing list. You will get updates every week uh, on what the show topic is and a reminder to, to join in. Um, it's also where you'll see the bios for everybody. Um, but we are going to um, do a short introduction uh, with the guests here with their bios. Um, but for their longer bios of finding out who's going to be on for the next week, you can pop over to the BS and beer show. Um, video conversations uh, of recordings of this will be available on green building advisor and on the BS and beer shows, YouTube channel afterwards. And uh, now I'm going to briefly introduce some of our guests tonight. We have Chris Magwood, uh, he's obsessed with reversing climate change by making carbon storing buildings that are also healthy, beautiful, efficient, and inspiring. Chris is currently the executive director of the Endeavor Center, a not-for-profit sustainable building school in Petersboro, Ontario. Um, all three of these guys have written books as well, so I'm not going to mention all of their books, but go out and pick them up if you're a bookworm like me. Um, we also have David. He's the principal at Arc and Tilt Architects and also the co-director of the California Straw Bale Building Association, advocating for straw bale building. So I'm excited to hear more about that. Uh, we often say straw bale building isn't good in New England, but I think that that is probably wrong assumption. Um, when he isn't Zooming, drinking beer, or discussing building science, he can probably be found bicycling or backcountry snowboarding. So super exciting. And we have Jacob. He is the co-owner of New Frameworks Natural Design Build, which offers services in green remodeling, new construction, consultation, and education featuring low impact, high performance building technology. Jacob merges his passions for fine craft, ecological stewardship, relationship to place, and social justice in all of his work. He's been active in introducing sustainability measures into building codes, including the IRC and Vermont Residential Building Energy Standards. So welcome, guys. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike uh, to give a brief introduction on the topic, and then you guys will I get think to you do your... Did you miss David? No. Uh, oh, 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 I did. Okay, sorry. I missed David. Sorry. I was, <laughs> was going to say, you were not paying attention. Uh, I was not. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. So that's just All a right. brief Sorry bio. You can read more on BS and Beer. Uh, and Mike is going to do uh, an introduction and, and then have you guys tell us a little bit more about yourself. So over to you, yeah. Mike. Thank you. Yeah, Brian's going to launch a poll. Uh, in means of introduction, um, the guys may reiterate some of this, but uh, just to bring everybody up to a base level, um, 
the benefits of bio-based building materials. We could also say how and why to build with carbon storing materials. If you think that business as usual, continuing the practices we have become used to over the last century is going to be the best course of action going forward, you are not paying attention or you are paying attention to the wrong things. We need to drastically reduce carbon emissions substantially and quickly on all fronts. Conventional construction materials like steel, concrete, PVC, and foam are amazing materials. They allow us to build efficient, affordable buildings that can last a long time. Unfortunately, those same materials and many conventional building practices may or may not make durable buildings, but they contribute significantly to climate change. At the same time, many materials are toxic. They leach poisons into the ground, groundwater and air. They can uh, and into the home's interior where they create in poor, where they can create poor indoor air quality. In some cases, they create moisture problems that lead to mold and individuals sensitive to mold is a quickly growing segment of our population. In addition, many materials we use in construction are extractive and exploitive. They may benefit the end user, but at a cost to the people and the planet that supplied them. Building with straw, hemp, and the other materials our guests tonight will talk about can be challenging and require a different set of principles and practices than you might have if you're focused on conventional production building. But if you care about the health of people and of the planet, hopefully you will come away from tonight's discussion with ideas for how to build better buildings with carbon storing materials. And with that, I will turn it over to Chris Magwood. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so we have a sort of a, a three a three prong uh, presentation tonight. So I'm going to be kind of making the the sort of case for uh, how carbon building storings work, why carbon storage in buildings is important, um, and how carbon storage and operational emissions kind of work together. And then we'll sort of uh, segue in, um, and Jacob and David will each sort of uh, refine that a little bit and, and sort of narrow it down a bit. Uh, to the point where David's talking about some actual uh, examples of materials and buildings, but um, I will click the screen share here and um, I will show you um, what I've got to say. So um, to start with, I think it's important as builders that we recognize that our, um, our industry has a, a huge impact on emissions on the planet. If you sort of total uh, operational emissions and all the emissions from manufacturing building materials, you basically get uh, the 49% of human caused emissions that are on the right hand side of your screen there. And so that's a lot of stuff going up into the atmosphere. And we all know that we have to stop putting that stuff in the atmosphere. But what we can't really afford to do is to just do a little bit less bad. Um, you know, it's great to think about what, what sort of, you know, moderate reductions we can make, but moderate reductions are still emissions and we really have to get ourselves to the point where our emissions are at zero or better. So what we need to do with our buildings is take that arrow in a downward direction. In other words, we need carbon drawdown to fix the climate problem. It's not going to be good enough to just do less bad. We actually have to start doing more good with our buildings. So that's kind of the, the, the context uh, of where this, this line of thinking around buildings as, as carbon sinks starts. And I just want to sort of uh, define a term that we're going to talk about um, a fair bit here because it's, it's central to the notion of carbon storing materials. And that is looking at material embodied carbon. So you might've heard the term embodied carbon, which sort of includes everything from the, the time uh, a raw material is harvested right to the end of life of that material. Um, that would be the, the, the full range of embodied carbon. We're really focusing here on the, the material portion of that. So the extraction, transportation and manufacturing of materials or if you've sort of come across the term before, cradle to gate emissions, that's what we're talking about. So all the emissions attributed to a material from the time um, it's extracted uh, through getting it to a manufacturing facility and through the manufacturing process. So obviously there are other emissions to talk about, transporting it to your job site, the emissions that, that occur when you actually build the building, um, but 
but this chunk, the cradle to gate chunk, is is the by far the biggest proportion of embodied carbon, and it's the part that happens right now. So we're going to sort of focus on on this. And the reason that that this is important is that there's a time value to to carbon emissions. So an emission saved or reduced or reversed today um, has a much greater impact on on uh, slowing climate change down than the same amount of emission reduction happening, you know, a year or two years or 10 years or 20 years in the future. And so when you think about a building, that red bar sort of represents the burst of emissions that happen in the sort of about a year leading up to the building being made. So while all the, the materials are being harvested and manufactured, all of those emissions sort of happen in that state uh, leading up to and including the construction of the building. So before anybody's moved into the building, before it started operating, there's this big burst of emissions. And what we'll be talking about is how to make that big burst smaller or even negative. But then what happens is we move into the building and we start to operate it. And year over year, we add operational emissions. So that, that total of emissions sort of incrementally climbs uh, year after year. And at some point in the future, it will equal or could equal the, the burst of emissions from, uh, from the, the, the materials themselves. And one important question is, when does that happen? Does that, do you catch up to your embodied emissions in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Um, but regardless of when you catch up to them, if you think about that time value, that the, the big burst of emissions that we're causing as builders actually comes from, from the materials up front. And while it's not insignificant, and we'll look a bit more at, at those operational emissions, um, at least for the first decade or so, which is when we really have to address our climate change issues, those material emissions are, are the big piece of the pie for us. And so, whoops, mosquitoes. It's mosquito season in Ontario there. <laughs> there if you see me waving frantically, it's because there's one buzzing my head. Um, so the other term that, that I think we need to sort of uh, explain is, is the notion of biogenic materials or the term carbon sink, carbon storage. And basically, oh, there it is again. Um, that is basically using plant materials for building materials. So biogenic is, is stuff that grows. And what happens is as plants grow, whether that's a, a tree in a forest or a, a hemp plant or a, a, a straw or, or any biogenic material that's growing, those, those materials grow by pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and separating the carbon and the oxygen. The carbon goes to building the body of the plant uh, and the oxygen goes to the atmosphere and uh, we get to breathe it, which is a great byproduct of that process. When we use those materials to make building materials, there are carbon emissions associated with the, the harvesting and manufacturing of those materials. So there is um, some degree of emissions, although quite often the plant-based materials have uh, quite low uh, carbon emissions on the material phase. And if the carbon drawdown from the material outweighs the carbon emissions of making the material, you can end up with materials that have net carbon storage. So if you're thinking about a, uh, an embodied carbon balance sheet for your building, anything that's an emission is sort of a, a positive, it's adding to your total, and these carbon storing materials are the negative numbers. These are the, the, the numbers that sort of draw down your overall total. And so without going too deeply into a sort of material by material breakdown, if you add up all the materials that we put into a, into a conventional building, and here's you know, a list of, uh, a, of a bunch of assemblies that are pretty typical of North American residential construction. This is a four-story, eight-unit building of about 10,000 square feet that has a, a, an emissions footprint of 212 tons of greenhouse gases before anybody's moved into the building. So before there's any operational emissions, there's over 200 tons of emissions associated with just making the materials for, for this particular building. And at the other end of the spectrum, if we use enough biogenic materials, we can make the same building. So it, it performs to the same level for the owner and operator 
it, it for all intents and purposes is the exact same building, but it can have a drawdown potential of 117 tons of emissions with the materials that are shown there. And obviously that's the opposite ends of the spectrum and there are sort of many gradations in between where you can you know, have less carbon footprint, a neutral carbon footprint, but, but this is sort of looking at of the range of materials that in North America, a builder could choose to build a building out of. Um, if you choose the highest emission materials, you'll end up where that red bar is. And if you choose some of the better materials, you'll end up where this green bar is. And so you can do things to make your building less bad. So you can see the building on the left. Uh, it's got an assembly that includes a lot of really high emissions materials. You can substitute those materials for less bad materials and we can get that, that overall emissions impact from, from the building, the same building, we can half it, no problem. We can do better than halving it by just you know, making some, some substitutions. And that's great, that's the, the less bad version. But we can also go far enough that we're actually starting to do the more good version. And here, the, that, the yellow typology uh, building, that's a pretty typical building. That's a building made out of materials that most builders in North America can get their hands on, that are affordable, that are code compliant. And so, you know, when I did this study, this was the most exciting result because, you know, this pointed out to me that, oh, like pretty much anybody who has a mind to think about the carbon impact of their building can make that yellow type building. And then obviously, what we're going to talk about today is this green type building where you're getting into more alternative materials where you are starting to work with things like, you know, straw and hemp and products that aren't as, as typical. Um, but somewhere in this range, anywhere in this range, you're starting to move into the range of doing more good for the planet instead of less bad. And then I just wanted to add what this looks like when you add the operational emissions in because we don't want to sort of take our eye off the, the ball that, that obviously buildings do have emissions uh, associated with operation. And so here are those two buildings, a sort of a worst case and a best case scenario building. And if I add 30 years worth of natural gas heating emissions, and I'm using Toronto, Ontario as, a, as my climate, um, you know, I am adding a significant amount of emissions to the total for that building. If I heat the, the green building, the carbon storing building, and it's a, it's a more energy efficient building, I can be doing less bad. I can start with a negative number. I can add uh, some, some emissions from the natural gas, and I've obviously done better for the planet, but in the end, that building still has a carbon footprint. Also in the less bad range, I could fuel switch that building and start using an electric air source heat pump to heat it. And because Toronto has a pretty clean grid, um, I can make a, take a big chunk off of the operational emissions, a very big chunk off of the operational emissions. And that's terrific. But the total footprint of that building is still in the less bad range. And finally, if I heat that building in Toronto with the same heat pump and I've got a more efficient building and it's a, building with biogenic carbon, now the operational emissions don't even bring the, the line up above zero. So that building remains a carbon storing building um, for the next 30 years and actually for about the next you know, 75 to 100 years. So in the worst case, a total footprint for 30 years would be 545 kilograms of emissions per square meter. And in the best case, a net storage of 85 kilograms per square meter and that's, you know, going, that's the sort of progression from the worst through the less bad and, and sort of, you know, pointing the way to what is actually uh, the more good version. And finally, I just want to sort of show you what that looks like. That's on a one building scale. Uh, but if we look at all low rise construction in the US, in 2017, there was about 240 million square meters of that type of construction. And so if we stick with business as usual, that's the equivalent of adding the emissions of 15 coal-fired power plants uh, to the atmosphere every year. So if we keep building buildings the way we build them, even if we make them super energy efficient, there is still this, um, this degree of emissions associated with the materials. If we can make those buildings carbon storing, 
then we're going to actually not produce that 15 coal plants worth of emissions and we're going to draw down the equivalent of 10 coal plants worth of emissions. So there's a huge you know, spread there in terms of you know, what's possible when we think about materials and if we think about using those biogenic materials as uh, um, really meaningful because the, the removal of effectively 25 coal plants worth of emissions would be the single biggest impact you know, ever in North America uh, in terms of carbon emission reductions, and that's just looking at at low rise construction, um, not even not even institutional commercial uh, type buildings. So that's the end of me trying to uh, set some context, and then we will turn it over to Jacob to, um, uh, or I don't know if we want to take questions now or how we want to how we want to do that. Um, yes, I'll, I'll throw one question your way that was that was just asked, um, and it it says, uh, "Is building a best case scenario carbon storing building better than not building that building at all in terms of carbon drawdown?" That's a very good question, and in all the time I've been thinking about that, nobody's ever asked that question. I mean, I guess you could make both arguments. In some ways, because we need to draw carbon out of the atmosphere if you can actually build a carbon storing building and it actually remains that way through a long enough period of time of operations, then I guess in some ways it, it is better than not building it. But I don't quote me on that. I'd want to think about that one a bit more before. <laughs> say well, one way. An, another way you could, stated is, you know, if you're not going to build a carbon storing building, then you're better off not building a building at all. Mm. Good spin. The other thing I throw in there, please. Oh, no, go ahead, Jacob. I was just going to say, when you're looking at like, like the whole building context, one thing that's not reflected in some of this data is um, all the MEP um, sort of chunk of the inputs in there, and that's really hard to offset. So if it's really truly a question of do we build or not, I would say the analysis might want to grow a little bit further to look at, you know, grand total impact and what that would compare to quite literally doing nothing. It's rare that that's a, a real case scenario, like I might build a new house or there will be no house here ever. Um, but in that hypothetical, I'd say the analysis might want to just get a little bit broader. Yep. Yeah, so I, I think we had David lined up next. Is that right or is hey. Jacob next? David. No, I'm gonna go. Yeah. And uh, first I just wanna talk about um, the beer I'm drinking because this is the BS and Beer Show. And uh, last week, Emily was drinking a bale of hay, uh, which reminded me, uh, Bruce King mentioned John Straub, who early on gave a number of us in straw building some advice, um, a little bit of it was actually about building. And um, so uh, Martin Hammer brought some of this beer to a party once and I'm really glad I tracked one down. So tonight I'm drinking a Straub Ale. And I think <laughs> it might be a Canadian Pale. But let me just um, read to you what it says on the back of the can here. A few words from our brewmaster, Dr. John Straub. Whether you're trying to keep warm on a cold winter day or looking to stay refreshingly cool on a hot summer day, there's nothing better than a Straub Ale. Straub Ale is lovingly crafted in our incredibly comfortable and efficient Straub Ale building. We invite you to raise some Straub Ale with your family and friends, and when you do, your home will be a Straub Ale home too. Cheers to that. <laughs> I think you may have just won the BS and beer game. Everybody has to up their game from now on. All right. With that, I think it's time to go to um, some prepared remarks. And I'm going to dive right in because as my colleagues know, I like to share a lot of slides. So uh, Chris and I are co-chairs of a renewable materials focus group for the Embodied Carbon Network. And the product of our work is um, being put out there by Architecture 2030 and the 
carbon smart materials palette. So if you visit materialspalette.org, you can get a lot of this information that I'm about to share. Simply, as we look for um, devices or machines that pull carbon out of the atmosphere, nothing does it quite as good as a plant. Um, whether it's a tree or a shrub or grain grasses or all sorts of other plants. They pull carbon dioxide out, lock it away in their cells, and a good portion of that goes into the soil. And uh, my co-director in the California Straw Building Association, Massey Burke, has done a lot of research on just how the, just how the potential of building with these bio-based materials can be doubled through soil carbon uh, sequestering. We grow a lot of straw worldwide, um, and that's enough to not only insulate all our buildings, but offset all of the transportation emissions worldwide. And there are a lot of carbon storing building materials, and I'm just going to run through a few of our favorites um, right now. Starting with insulation products and uh, from the Carbon Smart Materials palette, you can see this chart um, that uh, Chris helped prepare that shows uh, what you would expect. A lot of foam based or um, energy intensive materials have a carbon, emitted carbon footprint, but a lot of these bio-based natural materials actually store carbon in part because they're you know, plant-based in part because they take uh, very little processing often uh, in order to be able to bring them into our building materials. Uh, a few of the most common ones that are readily available, cellulose, of course, it's, um, you know, recycled newspaper and other wood-based material. Uh, sheep's wool, we have Havelock wool here in North America as a supplier. Um, and of course, cotton and denim and other um, waste fabric uh, insulation products have been around for a couple decades now. Emerging are uh, the use of chopped straw. Isostro is a German company. We're hoping we can uh, see this in North America soon. Rice hulls are remarkably fire resistant and an excellent readily available um, cavity fill insulation. And loose fill is a version of wool, uh, sheep's wool that's also available. Um, coming onto the market is mycelium. I actually think Jacob's firm uses this to insulate uh, doors in their extreme climate and possibly root mat or other uh, bio-based uh, materials. We then look to sheathing or envelope wrap and um, cork is of course renewable both as a bio-based material and that it grows on the tree without killing the tree. We harvest it and it grows back. Um, compressed straw board in the form of Stromit or Dura or other versions has been around since the 1940s, um, as has wood fiber board. And um, the product I'm most familiar with is Gutex, which you can get through 475 and other outlets. Uh, and then of course, exterior cladding, um, wood is ubiquitous, but cork and bark shingles are also products that are uh, readily available. And then other things that are um, either uh, coming, other ways to build with these bio-based materials, uh, stack block is a compressed straw product that we hope to see soon. Uh, Cal Plant One is a California-based firm making medium density fiberboard out of rice straw. And then um, wood chip ICFs uh, are available. I think Durasol and Fazwall are a couple products there. So. Um, you know, a more bio-based alternative to foam-based ICFs. And we can look to other um, plant-based materials. Uh, bamboo here used in its uh, natural form by an amazing South American architect, Simone Velez. Um, but here in Northern California, there's a company making a wall panel system uh, called BAMCOR, which are um, interior and exterior load-bearing uh, skins that have no studs. So it's a perfect wall in terms of um, minimizing thermal transfer. And uh, they're upping their manufacturing, which should hopefully uh, see prices drop uh, and a great alternative um, using uh, a resource that grows uh, in tropical climates. Hempcrete uses the um, starchy center of the hemp stalk, what's called the herd, and that is chopped and mixed with a lime binder uh, to create an insulative substrate for uh, plaster finish. Uh, so just an example of how that can be used. Light straw clay um, 
is a similar uh, principle of cellulosic material here, loose straw dipped into a watery clay slip and then packed into formwork, um, not unlike rammed earth, uh, creating once dry, a solid insulating substrate for plaster finishes. And um, our colleague, Paula Baker Laporte has done some beautiful buildings using the light straw clay system. Other versions of straw and clay included Adobe, which has been around a long, long time and has been in our building code since the 1940s. And then uh, cob, which is a form of building with the same mixture, more in its raw form. And there's an effort afoot to see that make its way into the building code uh, soon as well. And of course, wood is a um, renewable bio-based resource, albeit on a longer time frame. Um, so whether it's FSC salvaged or other types of reused timber, um, wood is a, is a viable choice. We're, of course, aware that cross-laminated timber is um, coming on strong and tall timber as well for um, larger mid-rise and uh, high-rise projects. A combination of timber and straw is a prefabricated straw panels. And I think Jacob's gonna talk a little bit about one of their projects later, but here's the Endeavor Center um, assembling prefab straw for one of their projects. Um, Mod Cell out of the UK um, was one of the earliest doing a, a straw panel system. And um, on its way to North America is Eco Cocoon. Uh, which packs loose straw into a timber frame in a pre prefabricated, um, assemble, quickly assembled construction system. Uh, so very exciting things that are emerging in uh, this area. And now uh, I think I need another strip, sip of this straw bale as we talk about this last section. One of our favorites, uh, straw bale construction, um, which is using it in its raw fuzzy brick form as pioneers on the Great Plains uh, discovered. Um, as our friend Bruce King would say, you know, straw bale construction is uniquely American and like democracy and jazz, we've exported it around the world. Uh, and that's something we can be quite proud of. Uh, so it has a history, surviving buildings over a hundred years old. Um, Five years ago, it made its way into the building code, uh, thanks to the efforts of Martin Hammer, David Eisenberg, and a lot of other people. Um, and there are many, many benefits uh, to this type of building uh, material. I won't go into all of them, but since this is a building science show, I do want to mention one of my favorite aspects of straw building, which is this lovely chart that shows on the red line the exterior temperatures uh, vacillating from 50 degrees in the middle of the night to knocking on the door of 100 degrees during the daytime. But that beautiful green line down the center here is the middle of the straw bale wall. And you can see it is precisely opposite the outdoor temperatures and the indoor temperatures in this space, which are comfortably swinging between 70 and 75 or so degrees. Uh, so that 12 hour time lag of thermal transfer of heat through a straw bale wall is part of why these buildings are so high performing. Another area that uh, people often bring up as concern is its fire safety. And uh, the Ecological Building Network along with CASPA did a lot of testing, including fire testing and showed that um, a lime plastered three string rice straw bale wall can achieve a two hour fire rating. And most significantly, this is the cold side of that wall. And you can see it took more than a half hour for any heat to transfer through that wall before it started to rise in temperature. So very, once again, high performing. Um, but not only laboratory tested, but real life tested. Several projects of ours and others um, survived the wildfires here in Northern California. Um, this is a home that was in the Redwood Valley fire. Uh, this is a picture the owner took of his uh, steel container um, photovoltaic system on fire outside the building. Um, but he and a neighbor survived the night inside his straw bale home. Uh, you can see some charring on the redwood posts of the porch, but otherwise a successful survivor. 
Um, we have a project under construction right now, a fire rebuild um, in Santa Rosa. And we were actually able, because um, fire rebuilds were considered essential, to have a COVID-19 safe bail raising a few weeks ago. And um, having um, bringing people together in the community that's, uh, that can be built is one of my favorite aspects of straw bale building. Um, it's one that isn't really a building science thing, but maybe it's a human science thing. Uh, so these are the homeowners placing the corner bale. And then we took a um, coronavirus safe group photo uh, out in front of the building when it was all done. Um, another straw bale fire survivor from Northern California. And just, you know, a reminder that we can create beautiful homes with this material. As Mats Merman told us, you can do anything with straw bales except have skinny walls. Uh, so know that a variety of styles are possible. And finally, to wrap it up, just to put some numbers to this, a 2,000 square foot straw bale home will store approximately 10 and a half tons of carbon dioxide. And that is the amount that can then offset what has to go in in terms of concrete and steel and other materials and the transportation of those materials. So this is sort of in the bank when you start with a straw bale home. I uh, want to mention another project from the UK by our friend Craig White. This is a little um, ADU that they've designed utilizing uh, chopped straw in compressed straw panels with a timber frame and timber cladding and they're able to store uh, 26,000 plus kilograms of CO2. Uh, one of our projects was a mixed use building where we stacked up the bales vertically tucked in between uh, two by six wood framing and then coated those with clay that was harvested on the building site uh, as well as locally. And that combination netted uh, 10 tons of CO2 storage in these walls um, versus what would have been uh, 60 tons emitted had we used a steel stud, fiberglass insulation, foam wrap, and steel cladding that would normally be used for this type of building. One of Chris's projects uh, illustrating 24 tons of CO2 stored. A uh, project that Jacob, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about where 11 and a half tons um, were stored. And then um, the best North American project I'm aware of, an Endeavor Center uh, project that stores 86 tons of carbon. And then finally, um, my uh, poster child for the potential of carbon storing buildings, a residential seven story project in France. And here the straw bales were placed inside of fiberboard boxes and craned into place and along with a timber frame, cross laminated timber walls and floor decks, and a little bit of cellulose offsetting the concrete and steel, we're looking at 1100 metric tons of carbon dioxide stored out of the atmosphere. Um, some resources for getting oneself deeper into straw bale construction from our California Building Association, as well as a free download of the code with commentary from our website. And I'm going to stop sharing if I can find the way to click that button and pass it over to Jacob, unless we have questions. That I think was let's, amazing. Uh, let's thank, take thank, one. Thank you, David. One question. Uh, the, the question that came up a couple times, I think during the, both of the first two presentations that maybe now would be a good time to address, is how confident um, do you all feel in uh, the numbers that you have for the um, global warming potential or greenhouse gas emissions of the materials that you consider? Um, and then maybe the second part of that is where do you look for that, um, for those, for that information and those numbers? Um, well, I'll have a go at this one because that I've been sort of living and breathing that for the last couple of years. So all, all of my data comes from um, these things called environmental product declarations or EPDs. And so that's um, a way of expressing both the global warming potential, but also six other uh, environmental impacts that, that materials can have. And that those are done according to an ISO standard. So there's a, an international standard for what needs to be considered and how it needs to be considered 
um, to go into an EPD. And so the numbers are as good and solid as anything else that we probably have in the building world. Um, what I like to tell people is they're at least good enough to tell you in, in car terms, they can tell you the difference between something with a V8 engine and something with a four cylinder engine and something with an electric motor. Like, you know, um, so the numbers for something with really high emissions, they may, you know, be off by five or 10%, but you know, that V8 engine is always gonna use more gas than a four cylinder. And there might be some variation in how you drive the four cylinder and your mileage might be better or worse. But, you know, we're, we're I think, you know, quite confident uh, if you're using numbers from environmental product declarations that you're at least using the best numbers that are currently available and that, and that are sort of, you know, wherever those are being made in the world, they're being made to the same set of rules. So they feel pretty solid. Uh, I'm sure they'll get better as time goes on, but um, they're, they're quite, I think they're quite reliable. Great. Shall we, uh, shall we move on to quick, Jacob? I have just oh, a yeah. quick question. You showed that, uh, that commercial building, uh, in France and there were, uh, several people who posted in the chat box. Um, is there any commercial straw bale going on in the U S that you're aware of? I know that's kind of like. Um, <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, well, the, the building I shared is a mixed use warehouse and office building. So I think that would count. There's a forest service center um, in King City, California. That was built with straw bale. Um, there's several wineries and olive oil production facilities here in California. Um, we've done a couple park buildings with it. So certainly non-residential is, is viable. Uh, we've got a visitor center at a nature preserve underway right now. Not just for houses anymore. Yeah, great. Thank you. Someone mentioned the fact that if we're going to have a really big impact, we have to do more than just residential structures. Uh, so thought I would throw it out there. Yeah, and I think that's where the promise of panelized uh, straw and other building products that integrate uh, this, these resources uh, really is going to have the greatest impact. It's fun to do a bale raising. We're going to keep doing them. I encourage everybody to do them, but we need all of these and more. Yeah. Ja Jacob, do you, do you want to present and let us know what you're drinking, if anything? Yeah. So I'm drinking, I'm kind of a cider guy. I live in a farm here up in the mountains of northern Vermont. We have a big orchard, and last year was a banner year for our apple orchard. So I put away about 50 gallons of hard cider in the basement. And we also grow our ginger in our high tunnel. So I've got a ginger infused hard cider. Um, it was a really long week. So I threw a splash of makers in there. So oh, I recommend it highly to anyone. Uh, that's my brew for tonight. It's really hard act to follow. This is no straw ale, nothing quite so clever, but super cheap. <laughs> Cheers, y'all. Thanks everyone for joining in. Cheers. Um, all right, <clears throat> let me uh, do a little screen share here. <clears throat> All right, is that successful? Yes. Great. So let me take a sip of water first. Um, I want to uh, pivot the conversation kind of way back out again um, and really put the whole conversation of materials into a larger context of um, ecosystems and supply chains and everything it actually takes to get these materials onto our site. Uh, I feel like we as designers and builders and people within the industry, kind of the easiest way into thinking about all of this is really to think about materials. It's the thing we engage with all the time. It's the most like sort of direct entry <clears throat> towards looking at all this stuff. Um, it's tangible, it's visual, it's the stuff we specify. And so it's super relevant that we'd be looking from a, a sort of a building centric materials perspective. Uh, but all those building products come from someplace. And for this to all be viable and for it to not just work, but to actually optimize the potential, not just for carbon drawdown, but for a whole host of other benefits that I want to you know, look at. Um, you need to you know, crawl or pull our way back along the supply chain back to where these materials come from and look at, uh, look at some of that. 
Um, that's a really big thing to do in just a handful of slides. So I'm just going to kind of do a bit of a scatter shot. Um, the way, uh, one way to kind of contextualize this, speaking from a, from a climate impact standpoint, we looked at, uh, uh, if anyone's familiar with Project Drawdown, if you're not familiar with that, go Google that when you're done with this. Um, but that was an incredibly well-researched project that looked at all the top carbon mitigation strategies and carbon, uh, atmosphere carbon reduction strategies um, across all sectors, across the globe. Um, and we took, I took a spin through there and looked at all of the ones. I found like the top um, 20 that directly related to buildings, things that I as a designer or builder could have some agency over, over choosing. And there was a whole mess of carbon reduction available if you were to like implement all of those solutions. Uh, and then I looked at all of the different agricultural and forestry solutions that, um, that sort of exist within the, the supply chain that makes those products available for me as a natural builder to have access to. And there is an equal amount of potential carbon storage. And many of those are some of the, the top items uh, on the list. <clears throat> for me, it really just sort of solidified with this very data-driven, comprehensive you know, perspective on climate impact that, again, it's not only necessary for this to be you know, in place for us as builders to have the products that these Euro products that we want, but there's this tremendous potential that we have uh, as very large consumers of products within the building industry to direct that market force and that power towards supporting some of our partner industries in agriculture and forestry to engage in more uh, you know, sustainable and regenerative practices. Um, and so, you know, one example that's kind of near and dear to our heart here is uh, rice, number 24 of the top uh, 80, 90, 100 solutions was improved rice cultivation. You know, the roots of the modern straw bale movement, as David was looking at, uh, is uh, a relationship uh, in the Southwest in California with the rice producers in California. Um, and what's really cool now, David mentioned the, the Cal Plant 1 MDF board, um, that plant has set up in the rice growing region of California. Um, and it's, it's one of those examples, it's not just sort of taking advantage of this material that happens to be around, the solution for disposing of high silica based straw residue, straw, uh, rice straw, uh, which is difficult to decompose in the soil on an annualized production cycle, was to flood these fields with water they can ill afford um, and anaerobically decompose that straw which releases plumes of not just CO2, but methane, which has a global warming potential over 100 years of about 25 times that of, of CO2. And within a 20 year time frame, has about like an 80 time uh, multiplying impact compared to carbon dioxide. So it's not just a matter of like taking advantage of this resource, it's actually significantly um, supporting a redirection of what is truly a mismanaged waste resource that's having a really negative impact from one industry and redirecting that efficiently to be a high value um, resource in the building industry that by virtue of its performance, as David highlighted, does a, goes a long way to reducing the operational emissions that Chris noted in his sort of analysis of the embodied plus the operational carbon. So that type of like organizing these systems together and looking at these stack benefits and aligning um, you know, waste streams or byproduct or tertiary, you know, products from, you know, industries that are creating carbon based materials and finding ways to incorporate those into the building stream is kind of like the, it's the ultimate in optimization. For me, I, I like the humility that's involved with that rather than being a builder or designer and saying, okay, this is the product that I need. Where can I go extract or exploit to be able to get the resources I need to create that product? It sort of, takes another angle of saying, what are the abundant available resources that I have access to, or that we as an industry have access to, that, that honestly need to be better utilized, that are currently waste, but could very easily be redirected and, and used in a more appropriate fashion. And how can we start to change our design practices, either as manufacturers or as designers or as builders, um, and create our practices around those waste streams in a positive ways. And that's kind of the heart of what uh, natural building is in, in, in many ways, and straws just has case study after case study of how that can be done effectively. Um, you're supposed to go forward when I push the right button. Hold on. There we go. Um, so I'm in the Northeast. <clears throat> uh, we have a lot of trees up our way. Forests are a really big deal. Um, oh man, that's a big thing to look at. Wood is, um, 
it's really interesting comparing agricultural and forestry resources when you're looking at the ecological uh, context. Straw and a lot of these agricultural products are short cycle uh, carbon-based materials. So that's you know, within a year or two or on a perennial basis, um, you know, very quick lapse around the sun before you've got a harvestable crop, as opposed to trees, which we're talking about decades worth of production. And so there is a much more complex analysis around, well, what if that tree was left in the forest? You're not going to keep straw hanging out growing in the ground for 50 years, whereas that may be the case for a tree. Um, there's a lot of complexity there, way beyond what we have time to unpack right now. But I kind of want to use that as an example, particularly in our region of where there are a host of other sort of levels and scales and, and, and patterns of incorporation around the impact of working with these materials beyond just this like sort of more narrow systems boundary around carbon in, carbon out, carbon stored. Um, there's a lot of this that shows up in land use patterning. Um, in our region, one of the greatest threats to forests is land use conversion uh, under development pressures, uh, uh, amongst other reasons. Um, similar with agriculture and having viable markets for these products is actually a, a pretty legitimate mechanism for maintaining that land use base as a working active forest. Um, so putting it into that economic and, and cultural context becomes relevant uh, because it's not just this theoretically that tree will just hang out there forever. Theoretically, that tree may be cut down in 10 years after that lot gets subdivided and cleared. And then the ownership and management of that forest gets deeply fragmented um, under, uh, uh, you know, an uncoordinated private stewardship. Um, we see a lot of that in the Northeast and it really reduces the potential of those forests to be managed for a host of different ecosystem services, including marketable products. So that context is really important. Uh, for me, you know, kind of coming of age professionally as a builder in a rural environment, I very frequently find myself having a lot of these conversations uh, with, um, you know, architects and engineers working in urban contexts on very large buildings. Um, and suffice to say, those barriers have to be broken down, you know, very rapidly for this entire industry to be able to galvanize traction and having a, a true deep carbon reduction across the industry. And so recognizing the critical need for investment in rural economies, and especially rural land-based economies, is a, an important part of this calculus. We cannot build all these wood and straw infrastructures of these dense urban built environments without a rural land base to support the material developments. Um, and so there's a lot of cultural, uh, you know, there's currently a tremendous amount of political and cultural divide that exists in our country that tends to break down um, along urban and rural lines, as well as I mean, pick your duality, architect, builder, you know, Republican, Democrats, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of those. I mean, kind of self-organized pretty quickly. I love the fact that some of my like, greatest allies um, in, in this work in, in forestry and agriculture are some of the most like conservative people I know. And some of the like frontline industries that are protecting our soil and, um, and sort of managing these vast ecosystems that we're relying upon are some of the most conservative industries in the country. And there's a whole lot of overlap of shared interests and shared goals and priorities that we can find if we can recognize, um, you know, again, patterns and systems and structures that allow us to work towards common goals. And I do not want to lose sight of that because these materials, you know, don't just show up on our shelves absent of any other deeper chain. And it's really hard to simplify that stuff in a one line diagram. Uh, so I get really excited about looking at the potential for a um, building material to open up all sorts of doors and break down all sorts of barriers to really, you know, again, optimize the potential of this work. Another place, looking at larger leverage points and beyond a building by building basis, um, or even a practice by practice basis, looking at so the bigger levers to kind of move our industry show up in policy for sure. Um, the World Green Building Council has now fully embraced the, the critical need for adjusting embodied carbon. Um, it's, you know, anyone that's been looking at green building within the last five years can pretty clearly see that body carbon absolutely at the table, every bit as relevant as energy efficiency has been for the last, you know, generation or so. And I feel like those of us working in this space right now are standing on the shoulders of giants that have established this incredible consciousness within our industry around energy efficiency and impact and the externalized impacts of the work that we do. And we need to, again, expand our focus a little bit more now and hold the impact of what it takes to actually bring these materials and buildings into production in the first space, even before they're operated. 
Um, and so, you know, we're starting to see some certifications show up. The zero carbon certification from ILFI is a great benchmark for that. The Canadian Green Building Council has an awesome zero carbon standard. I'm really pumped to see that same, same similar sort of nationalized standard show up in the USGBC, hopefully it's sometime soon. And we expect to just see more of those as sort of the carrot side of of uh, encouraging the industry to move towards accounting for carbon and holding value behind the carbon impact of the material. Um, and you know, Chris has been working with um, this township, uh, Jiro Dummer, uh, uh, that has set to the best of our knowledge, the first uh, uh, embodied carbon emissions cap uh, for residential new construction on a code basis uh, in North America. <clears throat> Last week, Chris was talking about uh, the implementation of the um, uh, concrete uh, embodied carbon uh, restrict uh, code implementation in Marin County. So those sorts of things can bring a little more stick along with the carrot, a little more regulatory structure in which we can uh, you know, start to align the value behind that, that part of the work. So really excited to see that stuff progress. Uh, we've been in a host of different conversations with a host of different organizations from you know, energy ratings to, you know, to code organizations of how do we start incorporating this data and these metrics into, into policy and code. Um, and then again, the, the, David mentioned it really well, the, the human science start of things. It is uh, a really artificial line that we draw about removing ourselves as humans from nature, as if it's this other thing that we have to manage as if we're not really a part of that. And the social ecology that goes into the everything from the trades production to how we treat each other, our, our value um, across different sectors of our industry, um, that all has to be in place. I mean, we are an opportunity now to co-create the future of the industry that we wish to see. And if we only limit that by designation of the technologies that we incorporate into our buildings, we are just going to keep repeating the same mistakes of the last hundred years. And we have a real opportunity here to align our sort of technological advances with desperately and badly needed social advances and how we take care of our, everyone from the occupant to the worker um, and everyone else along, along the stream there. And if there's one thing that this current pandemic uh, has brought to light is the deep social inequities that we see across our, you know, across our economy and how that truly affects everybody. So if we can create enough space to hold value in that as well, there is another place that we not only have the opportunity to optimize, but is a critical ingredient for this stuff to actually work. It really does take humans to be incorporated into this work and we have to hold value behind that. So just to give some a really quick um, sort of real tangible real world example of how our companies approach this. First, we're a worker owned cooperative and that is like so deeply baked into our like ability to execute this. Um, I could talk for a whole long time around that, but you know, we organized as a cooperative and decided as a group to set a priority around doing prefabricated straw production. Uh, the prefabricated piece is really important for us so that we were not having to set, you know, we used to drive all across the Northeast to build natural buildings because you know, Vermont has like 600,000 people and a median income of like $35,000. really hard to be a custom builder in Vermont and like stay within a 30 mile radius of your home. So we were driving all across the Northeast and we you know, doing the, the kind of the migrant builder thing. And that was, that was great, but we wanted people to not have to leave their families, not have to rack up a ridiculous carbon footprint getting to sites um, and try to create a way of working with straws and material, which we love in a more replicable fashion. And that's kind of my answer to, yes, absolutely, it needs to scale up. We need to be able to do bigger and bigger buildings because those buildings all have impact. Um, but it's like equally, if not more important to find ways to replicate small scale systems across the entire industry because the majority of square footage built on an annual basis in North America is still low rise construction. So that's just a different distribution of power of how, dis how decisions are made on a building by building basis. And that starts to look more of like a social movement and how do we get these technologies to replicate at small scale across the industry at the same time, scaling up in technology where the decision-making power is a little more centralized around larger buildings, larger projects, larger companies. Um, so anyways, a little bit of a sidetrack, but here we're, we're working with a very low, we took a lot of pages out of Chris's book, literally, he wrote a great book on prefabricated straw construction. Uh, Endeavor Center has been doing a ton of work on this, looked at some of the other companies like ModCell that David mentioned, looking at their technologies and developed a really low upfront capital, really simple to execute um, system of manufacturing, which is a whole other conversation of how we can, you know, inspire, you know, quick startup and, and, uh, and uh, flexible manufacturing systems to be able to create these types of prefabricated systems. We put this up in a building down, uh, down in 
in uh, uh, Western Massachusetts. Uh, we are really pumped to be able to support a straw grower in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont in the middle of winter, having, you know, having us buy thousands of dollars worth of product in February was a total win for that farm. Uh, we were stoked to be able to get organic family farm raised local straw and wood working with our local, uh, you know, sort of uh, forest producers in our region. Um, put this building up. It was really quick and fast. And the, uh, uh, the GC of record was super pumped to come back and just be able to throw a roof on it and have all the air barrier uh, and enclosure services fully provided. Uh, and that building ended up, yeah, this is the one that David showed about 11 and a half tons of CO2, um, you know, it was, a, it was a really successful case study of how uh, you can make a combination of like material tweaks that have their roots in more deep set patterns of reorganization to realize uh, not only great storage in this building, but in a, a form of you know, construction design and manufacturing replicability that could be adapted to the resource base and, and market and economic structure and wherever you happen to be in the country. All right, that's plenty of yakking for me. Let me unshare here. Hey, Jacob, before you're, before you're done yakking, I think um, you showed enough of that building that it, it piqued my interest anyway, and maybe you could just um, describe that, that wall assembly, um, take a moment to, to tell us how it's actually put together oh, yeah. and how it works. Yeah, should I reshare again just so you can see it? Would that be helpful? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Let's see. Sometimes two screens is just really confusing. Pardon me. All right. Uh, yeah, there we go. So in this case, uh, it's essentially a riff off a double stud wall with a bunch of straw in the middle. So that's essentially the kind of the crux of it. Um, we uh, worked with a structural engineer to dial in the bracing, sort of the shared load across the system. But it's essentially... Uh, you know, a double stud wall uh, with uh, some uh, structural tying at the top and the base to spread the load across the full panel. Um, the exterior you can see on the right, uh, we wanted to boost a straw kind of out of the box, so to speak, <laughs> is about R30. A little bit less, a little bit more, depends on whose numbers you use. Um, we wanted to get a bit of a boost on that for the energy performance requirements of this building. So there's about two and three eighths of wood fiber board on the exterior to kind of get us just that extra little bit closer R40. Um, in this case, we ended up putting a half inch plywood on the exterior.